Coming up on today's show, it's PS5 versus Xbox Series X, and we've got hands-on impressions of Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Yakuza Like a Dragon. Like a dragon. Ooh! Bird for the very oh, no. first time. I was not going to say Like a dragon. <laughs> with your claw marks. Marks next to next my. To I don't know. I don't know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> I was just letting you rip. I was going to jump in there and I was like, I feel like I'm going to mess up the flow. <laughs> What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I am Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Brittany Brombacher. Morello! And Miss Christine Steimer. Morello! <laughs> How was that? This is, this is my new favorite bit ever. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good bit. I'm into it. Whether it's your first episode or your 203rd episode, we're glad that you are here because it is a very special week. Not only are we exhausted and you are all exhausted from the events happening in the United States election, which we are not going to talk about, but it is almost next gen launch week. Yes. We are just one week away, ladies, even less than a week before the next generation begins. Dun, dun, dun. Exactly. Who's excited? Me. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm very excited. <laughs> I have no more emotional gas left in the tank, but I inside I'm skipping and jumping for joy. There are many exclamation points behind this smile. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah. And we know that there's a lot of stress happening in the world, not only because of the election, but the ongoing pandemic set against a variety of other things happening around the world. And we're nearing the end of 2020, but hopefully Thank you guys God. can find some joy and some solace in the passion that brings you all here to What's Good Games today, and that is video games. We're excited to get into it, but before we do that, I want to say thank you to this month's Patreon producers, Chewy's Godson, California Cated, Justin Foshi, Punctified, Ferris Atia. I did say it right. It is Atia. Nice. God dang it. I should probably just say it over, though, because I stumbled. Thank you to this month's Patreon producers. Chewy's Godson, Californicated, Justin Foshi, Punctified, F Paris, Paris? Paris, <laughs> Atia, Mohammed Mohammed, Marcus Brown, Alex Ergopoulos, and David Icolucci. Thank you so much for supporting everything we do here at What's Good Games. And welcome to our Patreon community, Heather Menegot. I like it. Mm, is that right? I'm not sure. Mean get. Menegot. It could be yeah. French. It could be. It could be like a menegot. Menegot. It could Menegot? be many things. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan Smet and Clayton Rogers. Remember, you can be part of the show at patreon.com slash what's good games by submitting questions for us every week. And also you can get the show ad free among many other fantastic membership benefits. And Brittany. We have some fun new podcast reviews. We do. We have one from X Plays R07, who I thought left a very mature comment that I wish more people in the world would adopt this mindset. I enjoy the show a lot. I know some people have a problem with their politics, and while I might not agree with every political statement or sentiment, others other people's ideas and beliefs are not threatening to me. As an adult, I'm always open to new views and opinions at and at the end of the day, I'll make up my own mind. I like, like that. Golf claps. Yes. Yeah, I thought that was very nice. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we got Bombs Bombs 2416, who said, Originally, I listened to your podcast to put me to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's worth it. Thank People paid good you. money for those relaxing takes. <laughs> take of that what you will, but you managed to wear me down, and I listen religiously every week for the top shelf banter and content. Thank you. I mean, we'll take it. Sure. We'll take it. Like, did you get confused in the app store? <laughs> you took a wrong turn at the relaxing apps and found our podcast to fall asleep to. You're like, I was looking for meditation music, but you know, what's good games? Yeah, it's close as enough. Instead. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, friends. Thank you. I love it. And just as a reminder, if you haven't taken a few moments to leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice, it is an amazing way to contribute to the show without spending a single dime. It just costs a few moments of your time. That rhymed. Good job. Thank you. It's because I've been doing so much flighting in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but I can't talk Ooh. about that this week. Stay tuned. Next week, impressions of the next installment of Assassin's Creed coming. I was going to talk about it today. 
And then I realized, nope, can't talk about it yet. But soon, everybody. Soon, soon. TM. But one thing that we can talk about, Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5. So this is an exciting week. So the embargoes have both lifted for console reviews. Full impressions of games that we're able to play on these consoles are still not happening until next week. I know. Trust us. We're with you guys. It's frustrating that there's so many different rolling embargoes for the content. We don't make the rules. We just follow Follow them. them. Yes, exactly. I try to. Exactly. Um, so thank you so much to Microsoft and Xbox for sending Xbox Series Xs for our team to evaluate. And thank you to Sony Interactive Entertainment for sending a PlayStation 5 for us to evaluate as well. So we're going to do kind of a head-to-head comparison here. And I think it's going to be fun to kind of hear, you know, your guys' impressions about your time with the Series X so far. And then I'm going to talk about my time with the PS5. Steimer did get a little bit of hands-on time with the PS5 as well uh, while she was here. So, um, Britt, why don't we Mm. start with you since you did our What's Good Games official unboxing of the Series X. I did, yeah. So we haven't admittedly talked about how we're going to go about, go about this, but I'll just start with some of the notes that I have. And feel free to butt in, butt your fine asses in. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I noticed was obviously the size of the Xbox Series X. It's a 11.8 inches high, five, almost six inches deep, and six inches wide. And I was kind of worried, like, where am I going to stick this thing? But I was able to take down one of my adjustable shelves, and it fits perfectly in my entertainment stand. So I'm very, very happy about that. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'll be able to stick the PS5 in there as well next to it because that is like four inches taller, and I think like oh, five yeah, inches it's, deeper. It's yeah, it's, it's a, a big chunky boy. boy. Yeah, I know. And it was so funny watching Andrea unbox it because it, compared to little Andrea, this PlayStation 5 looked like it was like half the size of your body. It looked like from the waist up. It was Honestly, it might be most over. of our torsos. Yeah. You yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's outrageously large. And when I put it on top of our entertainment center for the first time before John d- dismantled everything inside the entertainment center to rearrange all the cables and things like that. It just took up so much real estate. I'm just like, but why? Why is it so big? That fan, That's, baby girl. Yeah, I guess. They're like, listen, y'all bitched and bitched and bitched about it sounding like a jet engine about to take off. So we put an <laughs> extra large fan in to shut you up. So now you cannot complain that it's too big. So speaking of that, <laughs> you, you can go. always complain. But <laughs> you can always yes. complain. True. The Xbox Series X, the only games I've played on it so far has been Yakuza Like a Dragon and Watch Dogs Legion. It's been very, very quiet. I have not been able to hear a peep from it. So how does the PlayStation 5 sound? Um, same. The PlayStation Yay! 5 sounds super quiet. Haven't had any issues. I have been playing Destiny 2 on it. I tried out Assassin's Creed Odyssey on it i tried spider-man miles morales which we're going to talk about in the second segment and i also tried astro bot playroom which is so cute (laughs) um so i haven't had any performance issues whatsoever so far (laughs) of course you don't you don't want to go into a brand new generation going well you know it's kind of broken um it's not it's not at all but we'll get to that in just a moment it doesn't sound like a jet engine. There you no, go. no I mean, so Can far, confirm. I've already gotten what I wanted out of this generation, which is quiet. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have to worry about sitting in my apartment and being like, I have to turn up the volume on my TV just to fight the sound from the box itself, which yes. I've had to do. Mm-hmm. It's not great. No, oh, it's true. The next thing I have written down was the installation of the console itself. Now, obviously, like, it's pretty cut and dry. You stick the power cord in the box. You stick the HDMI into the box. Whoa, you got a console. Uh, Obviously, you boot it up. But what's interesting this generation with the Xbox is they have the Xbox app. And I don't remember this being announced, and it probably was. There's just so much information that comes during this generation that you just kind of you can't remember all of it but anyway so you have yeah you have an app and you can either use the app to help set up your xbox or you can do it the old-fashioned way i was definitely old school and i was like i am not installing another app on my phone i absolutely do not need another app on my phone so it was just you know like okay manually connect to your wi-fi enter in your xbox live account enter in your password and then from there it was pretty much easy going there was an update to the controller obviously an update to the system itself And what's nice, too, and what I really appreciate is that if you do have a last generation Xbox, I'm sure PlayStation does the same sort of thing, 
you can transfer a, over a hundred of your settings over. So like the privacy settings, for example, will transfer over. So you don't have to go through the console and reconfigure all of those, which was really nice. And I did appreciate that as well. And then when I wanted to download Watch Dogs Legion, which I had already downloaded on my Xbox One X, I was just had to go to my games and apps and then all of your library is there. Obviously you need to re-download the games you want and then you're off to the races. It's pretty simple. Yeah, it was a very easy out of the box experience for Series X for myself as well. I already had the Xbox app installed on my phone. So I mm. did use the app and it was just like you snap your fingers and it was done. Nice. It, the auto importing of your settings was a really nice feature that Xbox added. And I think the thing that really stuck with me is that it didn't feel like it was lab laborious in the way that setting up Xbox One was the very first time. I remember the whole calibration I had to do, which felt like it took a really long time when I set Xbox One up at the very beginning of the generation. But also, it's mostly because we had the connect to Russell with. Oh. <laughs> if y'all oh, remember yeah. the Xbox One launched with a mandatory connect. <laughs> Yeah. Oh boy. Oh yeah. That feels like like a lifetime ago. Yeah. So how was setting up the PS5? Was it pretty similar? So in full disclosure, the PS5 setup was a little bit different because when the unit was sent to me, the PSN wasn't set up with the update that is going to be available to consumers when the console officially launches. So I had to manually install an update via a USB key, and that is just not going to be what players have to do right. they're going to turn on their console for the first time and go through setup like they would any new playstation device and so i just want to you know make sure that people know that the experience i had it's not going to be the experience you had but other than me having to go through that one extra step like it was super easy i think for me the biggest difference between the two experiences i had is that once i had my xbox set up it didn't feel a lot different and i'll go into that in just a second yeah the playstation 5 felt like that that like glittery, sparkly eye, <laughs> like, oh my God, it's new. It it's has like shiny. a new coat of paint on it. Yeah. They like buffed it out. They put a little wax on her. You know, I like, mean, yes, yeah. exactly, Steimer. I mean, the, there's a new animation. The system sounds are new. And the new UI is really, really beautiful. Like the way that they updated it, it looks pretty. And it feels like a new generation. It feels like a new piece of hardware. Yeah. Whereas Xbox Series X felt exactly like my xbox one x just better like it's just, just like, oh cool just this faster. just runs faster like it's not lagging behind when you're moving through the menus not too That's totally it yeah not too dissimilar to upgrading from like an iphone 10 to an iphone 11 yeah it's, you know mm -hmm. like when you turn your iphone on the home screen isn't is literally the same yeah. um it just moves a little faster and the camera is nicer right but Overall, like the performance improvements you get with Xbox Series X are really the driving factor and the difference between the, the experience you have on Xbox One X. Now, I was mentioning to Steimer earlier that I think the difference for somebody who has the base model Xbox One or even just a standard Xbox One versus a Series, um, or excuse me, a One S or a One X going to Series S or Series X is going to be very different. Yeah, I think the performance and the look and feel. Well, it's is like be. like the older older iPhone you have, right? <laughs> to like yeah. the newer one, you're like, oh my god, this is amazing! Exactly. It's night and day. But oh, yeah. I feel like it just reminded me too of of how much I kind of still really wish that Microsoft would overhaul its UI better. Like I know they they have overhauled it, but like in my opinion, they haven't made it better. I'm just yeah, like, I mean, it still feels it, cluttered to me. It still feels a little mm -hmm. bit not intuitive. I yeah. still feel like there's too much like hitting my eye when I was looking at it. Um, Too much stimulation. Yeah. So for those yeah. of you listening, the Xbox Series X UI is the same update that got pushed to the Xbox One consoles, right? So yeah. it's literally the same. And I was doing some side by side comparisons. And like Simon said, yeah, like the leg is so much better. Um, you know, booting up the store, checking out games, doing a search, like you don't have that leg anymore. And that's the shiny coat of paint. I would say like, yeah, the, the UI, it's kind of interesting because to access everything now, you have to like scroll down. And yeah, then you just have like vertical. these tabs. Yeah, yeah, it's vertical. Um, but when you do bit it up, I mean, which takes like 0.2 seconds, everything that you need is there, right? It's like, okay, here's your game. You can pin things to your homepage. So if you only like want a specific amount of things, you don't have to worry about scrolling to find it. It's all there. But yeah, some of it does feel kind of cluttered. And so maybe another overhaul will be coming in Just the a quick round, a quick edit, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think that. 
I yeah. think giving people the ability to customize their homepage, like you customize your desktop on your PC would be nice. Like the idea you that- You can. Yeah. I mean, well, you can yeah. customize it, but I mean, you can't really remove things that you don't want to see, right? Like you, I don't- well, because like the this, store, like the store button and some of the promotional stuff that they do on the homepage, I'm like, if if there was a way for me to like turn that off, that would be, that would be great. Yeah, I, I yeah. think it is really a lot. I hate, I fucking hate seeing the ads. If I'm an Xbox yes. Live Gold member and all this shit, get that shit. Remove off my, my ads. Be like the ad free tier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I honestly don't games. think that that's that much to ask. I think if you're an Xbox, you know game pass ultimate subscriber and you are have like their top tier subscription you're paying for live and for the premium pass you've bought your right into not seeing promoted games and promoted ads from microsoft even if it's just microsoft content i don't care like i pay you guys a lot of money for this system i don't want to be served ads for games that i'm probably not interested in now both consoles, I believe, have personalized data settings. There's a lot more fine-tuning of how both Microsoft and Sony are using your personal data this generation because of all of the different laws that have been enacted around the world since the last generation launched, right? And so there is that to consider. You can turn on personalized <laughs> you know, content if you want, but I opted to just not send my data, which I'm sure a lot of people do. Some people yeah. are like, meh, I don't care. Um, but that's going to be your personal choice. Now, this is, again, just a, just a small thing, but I'm with you, Brittany, in the sense that it looks identical. It feels identical because it, it is, is identical. identical. It is identical. <laughs> yeah, it's the same, basically the same OS, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, that said, I didn't have any problems at all booting up games once they were downloaded and installed and having my save data sync very fluidly. Something that I was talking about online with... Jackie Collins for another show was about she had asked you know what's the difference between uploading my save data between PS4 to PS5 and Xbox One to Series X and I said well Xbox as a lot of you know has automatic cloud backups whereas PS5 does not and that's because PS5 has that tied to your PlayStation Plus subscription and quite frankly if you have automatic updates I had my cloud storage maxed out quite quite quickly yeah. and so i had to turn them on manually and so i only have specific games set to do auto uploads mm. yes but both mm. consoles felt really seamless i remember when we spoke last week Brittany, you had said oh i already just unplugged my xbox one like it's it's yeah i mean i don't know why you would need closet. to go backwards <laughs> we had a good time xbox one goodbye and i was like oh, i don't think i'm quite ready to do that yet but now that i've been playing on the two new consoles i'm like i don't I guess I, I guess I don't have a reason to yeah. go back because the cross-gen compatibility so far has been really excellent. Yeah, there is mm -hmm. no need for it. Um, and yeah, there was an interesting note I saw from from Alana from something that I hadn't really considered before, and she was saying if you are in a position um, where you're getting these new consoles uh, and you're looking to, you know offload the old ones think about donating them to your local children's hospital and i was like oh that's a really nice sentiment something i never actually thought about doing before mm -hmm. yeah. oh yeah i saw greg miller is also donating a couple of his consoles as well um certainly something that is an amazing option i know there's a lot of people out there that are trading in their consoles yeah. to be able to offset the cost of upgrading and feel confident knowing that you're going, as long as you have your save data backed up yep. on a USB stick, just because it's always good to keep a, a copy of your backups, being able to re-download your games is a very simple process on both consoles and both systems make importing your save data in the cloud, if that's what you choose to do it, or, you know, um, plugging in a USB stick works as well. Uh, very simple. I did not have any problems when... I brought down my cloud saves from Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and then I transferred my save from uh, Watch Dogs Legion from Xbox One to Series X. It's actually kind of nice because it kind of forces you to spring clean. It's like, okay, do I really need to re-download all these games? It's like, nah. No. Nah. Just move on. It's fine. But they're there if you need them later, and like yeah. that's the good point. It's like, just let them live in the lovely, you know, you got a picture of it. You got the title screen in your little, in your little Manage Games app. Just leave it there. You can look at it for nostalgia, but otherwise, like, eh. Yeah, I re-downloaded Beyond Good and Evil, though. Oh, nice. I saw that. Because I was like, I want to play this again. I've been playing this in a long time. I wonder how it'll run, to be honest. Because I remember trying to play that on my 
360? Uh, Xbox One? I don't remember what, I don't remember when, but it was that the, obviously the original. Um, and I don't remember why. I remember, I definitely stopped playing because I think there were audio issues or something with it where it was like cutting out sound. That sounds right. That game is old. It is old. It's very old. How is the controller though? I'm like, Ooh, dying I was to just, know. I was just gonna ask you that. So uh, yeah, I was, oh. I was thinking we would move on to into controller land next because I yes. think that's an, an another similar area where the PlayStation Five feels so much different, mm-hmm. and then the Xbox One kind of felt the like same. the same. Yeah. So the Xbox Series X controller looks almost identical. The key difference being that they have swapped out the D pad for the modified D pad that we see in the Elite controller. But overall, the footprint of the controller is just a hair smaller. We're talking like a millimeter uh, smaller overall. But if you put them side by side, the naked eye cannot tell the difference. Um, They're essentially the same controller. Um, Like any new controller, the buttons felt good. I mean, it just just feels like a a nice brand new (laughs) Xbox One controller, but it's Xbox Series X. So nothing really to report for me as far as the Xbox Series X controller. Brittany? Well. Oh yes, I have a few things to report. Oh. So like as uh, ooh. so like, yeah, like you said, it's a little bit smaller, and because it was designed for people, you know, to be more comfortable with folks with smaller hands. And I will say, like, yeah, it's very comfortable, very nice. And the triggers and the uh, bumpers are a little bit more rounded, and there is like this little grip on the underside of the handles that kind of extends onto the triggers a little bit into the buttons. And I'm curious to know what you ladies think, because at first I was like, oh, these are really nice, but they're not the same kind of rubbery grips that you'd find, I believe, on the Elite controller or even like right here, I have the Gears 5 um, special controller and the back is like kind of rubbery and nice. Mm -hmm. The ones on the Xbox Series X are kind of plasticky and like this is going to sound really weird, but I sometimes have really sensitive hands. And so I could, I think at this point I could take or leave those little bumps. Like they don't feel pleasing all the time. Sometimes they're kind of like scratchy or itchy. Yeah. Textures Mm -hmm. on something that you're holding for so many consecutive hours in some play sessions is absolutely something to be considered and something I'm going to yeah. talk about with the dual sense in just a second. Oh, and then obviously there's the new share button, and which is cool, but I haven't really been able to use it because apparently they don't want me sharing photos of Yakuza just yet. And I no, not yet. yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of those network features we're not going to be able to talk about today because they're just not turned on yet. But yeah. we'll have more impressions once the consoles officially launch, of course. Yeah, but I mean, other than that, like I, I like the controller. I mean, it's like, it's not a huge jump from this Xbox One X to the X to the Xbox Series X. I will say I do feel like it's a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more pleasing to hold, but I just like those grips on the back. I wish I could like kind of take them off. It's not too bad, but you can't really take them just off. Just get some sandpaper and start filing that sand shit down. Just get some sandpaper and like sand that shit down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that'll go yeah. over well. Nothing bad will happen. Please don't no, sandpaper your controllers. No. <laughs> not, not, I would not recommend that. Um, go for the rustic look. But yeah, I do. I'm with you. I, I think that like overall, it's a nice controller. No complaints. Now, going back to the PS5 controller, specifically the DualSense, I think Sony really did a great job of taking that idea of we really want to innovate this generation and do something different. And just like the UI, how it's shiny and new, the controller is shiny and new, it feels a lot different. It feels like a very different upgrade than what the DualShock 3 had to the DualShock 4. And that was obviously a very good upgrade. I think we all can agree the DualShock 4 is probably the best Sony controller that they've ever created. The DualSense is doing something very different. So I do like that the way that they changed the light bar. So previously the light bar had a pretty obvious and sometimes very obtrusive light that projected from the front of the controller. And it was used in the beginning for certain games with um, that were using the eye tracking camera and the motion controllers, there was a bunch of like technical specifications that you could use that light bar for. In addition to you know just customizing the color depending on what developers want to do with it. Yep. I like how they have really made it a subtle change. So now there's just a light outline around where the touchpad is. Yay, so instead of having great. like a like a spotlight like a on your mega, controller, yeah. it's just a where it just glow. like reflects back to you in your oh, television. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's great. 
Yeah, so I really like that. So that's absolutely going to help with battery time. I know that there's a setting where you can dim the light on your light bar on your PS4 now, but having this um, be much more subtle, I think is great. The touchpad is bigger um, and I like that it has more surface area. I really loved the innovation of the touchpad in the DualShock 4 and I think that we're going to see more developers continue to utilize the touchpad on the PlayStation console to do really cool gameplay stuff. I think we've seen a variety of games do really interesting things with it. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what developers do. Um, but the real difference to me so far in the controller has been the way that they've changed haptic feedback and rumble. And yeah. I know that they've talked about it in videos and it was a big thing talking about haptic feedback when Mark Cerny did his big, very nerdy technical speech <laughs> earlier in the year uh, where His he mostly talked about <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> about 3d audio which we'll get to in just a second but the haptic feedback is really something you have to feel to believe it's kind of like vr in that sense that you don't really understand what it does gameplay wise until you feel it now part of me is very excited about this and steimer got to experience a little bit of it when we were playing through astrobot playroom and then part of me is like, I don't know if I like that, though. Because um. on one hand, I'm like, ooh, this is really cool. And then on the other hand, I'm like, ooh, I feel like I don't like this in certain specifications of the use of it. So, for example, in, in the playroom, in Astrobot Playroom, there is a section where you are shooting little arrows. And the way that you pull back on the trigger to kind of pull the arrow back on the string you can feel the tightness increase the longer you hold the trigger down in the haptic feedback on the controller. So it does really give that kind of immersive gameplay feeling of I really feel like I'm pulling the string on this arrow back, even though I'm just literally pushing a button down on a controller. And I thought that that was a really cool touch and how they're going to implement that in games going forward, I think will be interesting. But then there was a moment where there was like an explosion where I set something on fire um, it was in Spider-Man Miles Morales, actually, and it gave me a really intense shockwave of rumble through the controller, which actually set off weird nerve endings in my hands that made me tingle in an uncomfortable way. Oh, that's bizarre. <laughs> no shit. Get yes. your nerves I, going. I literally dropped the controller and was like, I don't like that. Yeah, no, she did. <laughs> oh, I was there. No. I, can, I can attest. And I was like, are you okay? <laughs> I d I and you were like, it. the controller made me feel weird things. Yes, <laughs> I, I like, hated okay. it. That's crazy. So so from what you've played so far, because there's an option, I know, to shut that off. Do you yes. think you'll keep it on? I think it really depends on the game. I think okay. that... In certain games, it's going to be, I think, a really nice, fun, immersive feature. And then in other games, I don't know. It's like I don't want to turn haptic feedback and rumble off completely just for specific sensations. But I hope that developers are going to be cognizant of how that's going to affect players once the dual sense gets into the hands of millions of gamers and they're able to get candid feedback <laughs> um you know on on the reddits and what have you of how people feel about it because i think overall it's a really cool piece of technology and the way that they've incorporated rumble and haptic feedback into the buttons and triggers and the microphone in the in the um, controller, you know, which is an ease of use for accessibility and things like that. I think they're doing a lot of really cool tech things, but I think it all comes down to, you know, balance and making sure that developers aren't doing weird things with it. Because as you mentioned, Brittany, sometimes I have sensitive hands and, <laughs> and um, you know, I don't like my hands to feel things when I play games that I don't want to feel. I think um, there's also like a fatigue issue probably at some point if you're yes. playing a game for X amount of hours, like do you really need a rumble every time you do a thing? Uh, oh, Nintendo's the worst at that. <laughs> yes, like, they are. I mean? yeah. Oh, man. I turned it yeah, off yeah. on my Switch. I was just like, nope, Same. we're done. Yeah, we're done. Same. I, I don't, trying to I sit in a doctor's office? Sounds like you're smuggling a vibrator in your pocket or some shit. <laughs> Not good. I swear it's not me. It's my video game console. <laughs> it's oh, a very no, expensive vibrator. Because I know Nintendo was touting their 3D, oh, what they call it, 3D rumble is what it was. And there was that example of like the ice cubes falling down the Joy-Con. And oh, I feel like there's ice cubes in there. So I know like you're only two people. So cool. But do you think, Literally. do you see this becoming like a staple for gaming going forward to include this kind of feature in a controller? Or do you think it's like a fun little gimmick? 
That's a great question. I honestly don't know because I think that Rumble has been in controllers now for what, a the while. last three generations Yeah, mm-hmm. as a standard feature. But what they're doing with haptic feedback specifically, I think is really innovative and is something that quite frankly, console gamers have a leg up on PC gamers about, you know, PC gamers are constantly like bragging about the, you know, input speed using a mouse versus using, you know, sticks. And there's nobody's denying that, you know, a keyboard is a very utilitarian device for playing games, but you can't get the experience that I had with haptic feedback and rumble in the dual sense with the mouse and keyboard. And I think that's I'm trying to imagine like <laughs> next year seeing a rumble keyboard. <laughs> I'm sure oh, something whoa. like that exists. I'm sure it does. But, but it like would be just the, weird, t- like the because especially especially with like the manual switches, if you get if you have an actual gaming keyboard, I just feel like that you just couldn't. I mean, it would be weird. Be yeah. Really weird. It, it would be. And I think it would be much more difficult for developers to work around the many different types of key bindings that you can do um, to standardize it. And I think that that's one of the benefits, of course, of creating code specifically for a locked platform like PlayStation 5 or like a Nintendo Switch, right? That, mm-hmm. you know, developers know what those parameters are with the hardware. And so they develop specifically for those parameters. And I think Sony has really set themselves apart with what they started with the DualShock 4 and then have elevated with the DualSense. And I think that's a huge selling point for gamers who are looking for a really fun feature to incentivize them to upgrade their console, whether they're still on a PS3 or maybe they have like an early generation PS4 and they're like, well, I don't know, why should I upgrade? And I'm like, oh, I was really blown away by some of the features just in the controller, not to mention the console really feeling new, really feeling like a different brand new generation experience. And just, it's just really got that kind of Christmas morning excitement feeling when I yeah. turned it on for the yeah. first time. And I didn't get that when I turned on my Series X. And that was a because, bummer. Like <laughs> as much as I appreciate that they're trying to make the transition really easy for you and you will, ex- you will know instantaneously, like when you get in there, how to, how to use everything it did definitely lack that impact of like excitement because you get in there and it looks like your old console and that is slight like it's got a slight tinge of disappointment to it only because when you look at something like the ps5 you're like ooh, shiny new toy i'm very excited about this uh and you like have the new ui and you have the newer controller and you have all these things yeah it definitely has that more of that Christmas morning or like ooh, birthday present kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 100%. No, I'm definitely, I think, more excited to, don't get me wrong, like I love my Xbox Series X and playing Yakuza on it. It's been fantastic. But I am so excited to get my PlayStation 5 and unbox it and see the big white chonky boy and see the new <laughs> the new, the new uh, controller and put it in my hands and turn it on and see the UI. Like that's what I feel like it, a typical next generation launch feels like when you do have like that brand new experience. Yeah. And like not knocking what you said, Simon, like not knocking Xbox for doing what they did. I mean, it makes sense. It makes the transition easy. It just kind of lacks that like, Whoa, that mind blowing, that glitter and gold, the sexiness. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's it's a little yeah, like I said, it's 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 a valid choice to make. It just when you like want yeah. want new shiny yeah. thing sort of feelings yeah. and you don't get that, that's like where you're like, oh what want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm with you. And I do want to touch on some of the audio stuff. So 3D audio is another big selling point for the platform for PlayStation for PS5. As I mentioned earlier in the year, Mark Cerny talked a lot Mm. about ear molds and (laughs) and talking about people's ears and audio and a bunch of things that really went over a lot of our heads. But I can't tell you the moment of like pure unadulterated joy that I had when I turned on Destiny 2 and ran around the tower on the PS5 for the first time and heard things in the tower that I had never heard before. Oh. And I wasn't using the Pulse 3D headset, the Sony proprietary headset. I was just using my regular uh, Logitech G733 headset that I had plugged in and, you know, worked great. But, like, I the way that they were moving audio around in the headset was just different in a way that I can't quite articulate but I just sat there and was like wait a minute why is it I was like gosh it sounds so cool it sounds so different I was like (laughs) but I've played this game so many times for so many hours that I've why have I never heard it like this before 
And it really comes back to that there's a lot of onboard processing that's happening on the PlayStation 5 with the hardware that they specifically tuned for the audio in video games because they wanted that to be a really big experience for gamers to have in this next generation. And that really kind of plays into this total immersion experience that they're really pushing with the console that leads with the haptic feedback and the rumble and the controller and then of course with the the audio and once again on display in astrobot playroom which of course is the standard piece of software that comes with every playstation 5 everybody who owns a playstation 5 gets to try the playroom and it's so fun and just like hearing all of the way that they throw sound around inside your headphones is just like that it's just like, it's magical. It just feels magical in a way that you want a next generation to feel. And I just, I just like, ugh, it was giddy. It was so cool. And it was just <laughs> Destiny. I play, I play and listen to Destiny all the time. But like the guns sounded different. The sound effects of the Sparrow sounded different. Even the loading sounds going in and out of the different planets sounded different. Like, and I know that they haven't even pushed the update for Destiny yet. <laughs> this is just the backwards compatibility version of Destiny 2 that I was playing. It wasn't the updated for next-gen launch. And Bungie has already said that all of their improvements that they're doing for PS5 and Series X aren't going live until December 8th. And so this is just the base game that I'm guessing PC players are getting. I, I don't know <laughs> how PC audio is and the way that the drivers work. I guess it largely depends on your audio setup and your driver and your, you know, your CPU and GPU setup on your PC. But yeah. um, again, it comes down to the ease of use for consoles of how I didn't have to do anything different. I literally it just, just turned it on and downloaded Destiny. You just needed to give that chonky boy a home somewhere on your media console. <laughs> yeah. Just had to literally drill holes in the back of my media console <laughs> yep. to run the cables to the right place and get enough airflow. We bought, so I should say John, this is John's big project, bought exhaust fans that he mounted onto the back of our entertainment center, drilled custom holes, mounted exhaust fans like on a PC case. <laughs> John and I lifted that thing <laughs> to make sure. in and out of the house so that the, he could drill holes into it. Exactly. <laughs> it was a whole thing hey, that happened. You do what you got to do. I did do. my exercise for the day. Yeah. Rearrange your whole house. But I think that's an awesome example, Andrew, because if anyone would know the sounds of destiny, it's definitely <laughs> you. And 3D audio is something, again, like the haptic feedback, where I think it sounds cool on paper and like someone can talk about ear molds so your ear falls off or whatever. But until you actually hopefully experience it, it yourself, hopefully not. That would be a bad dysfunctional ear mold that yeah, I would not yeah, recommend putting exactly. in. Anywho, that's great. I'm very excited. You're excited. I'm really excited about that, too. I did order the um, the headset. I don't remember what the actual name of it's the called. The Pulse 3D Pulse. headset. Pulse 3D headset. I did order that. I'm excited to try that one out. We do have a question from Gabe Hewitt, patreon.com slash games, who asks, can you speak to the loading times of either system yet? I'm curious if any of you play the same game on different systems and experience any difference in load times. Thank you for the insight. I can actually, because I tested PS5 load times in Destiny 2 alongside Fireteam members that were playing on PS4. So to confirm, okay. you can cross play with people in Destiny specifically. I don't know what it is for every other multiplayer game. Um, so if you have clan mates like I do that aren't upgrading this fall and you want to still be able to play with them, PS5 can play with PS4. Um, my friend, uh, Solid Snake Ocelot, friend of the show, um, has a SSD installed inside his PS4. I know that there are some enterprising gamers who took that extra step. Um, we essentially would load in at the exact same time because now I have an SSD installed because it's standard on every PlayStation 5. And I would load into instances a full 25 seconds ahead of everybody on a standard <laughs> PS4 or a PS4 Pro that was just working off of the regular PS4 hard drive, not a custom like SSD install. So nice. I mean, to me, that's like a pretty big chunk of time to be waiting inside of an instance for your friends, particularly in multiplayer when you're just like at a black screen. Yeah. Just waiting for everybody to, to load in. 
Um, I will say the download times, unfortunately, did not improve because that's still bottlenecked by the PlayStation Network, which yeah. I'm hoping that they upgrade soon. <laughs> but so that was that was a bummer. But overall load times, I, and you can obviously speak to, to Yakuza, but for me, for Watch Dogs Legion, and really the big thing that was noticeable was Assassin's Creed Odyssey. When I would fast travel before, when I was playing on PlayStation 4, it would hang quite a bit, sometimes 30 seconds or more, up to 60 seconds, depending on, you know, if I was moving to a very different part of the world and a lot of assets had to load in. Here, we're talking a couple seconds, three to five <gasps> seconds oh, load yeah. time. Oh, it's so nice. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's it's one of the improvements that I'm so, the most excited about, I think, with this new, next generation is the load times. Yeah, and like, yeah, because uh, they're so quick, I can't even read the tooltips, which kind of like annoys me. I wish like unloading. <laughs> they're like, oh, wait, we didn't think about this. Now I that know, the consoles it's... load so much, no one will be able to read our tips. Right? Seriously, exactly. yeah, because the game came out in Japan earlier this year before the new consoles, right? So now they're like, oh. So what they, they just need to do is make a little press A to continue, you know, and then like you can yeah. go on your bad self. Uh, so I tried. Uh, a game out on xbox as well and i tried outward which was one of my favorite games that i played in the last few years and as much as i love this game it's a small little team and the loading screens have just like sucked so i tried it with this one so on the xbox one x it took 43 seconds to load a save on the xbox series x it only took 14 seconds and then booting up a game took 25 seconds on the xbox series x and on the xbox one x it took almost a minute so it's it's really nice to be able to go back and kind of like play some of I mean, like I don't go back and play older games, but for example, Outward's getting new DLC. So I know I'll be playing it. So I redownloaded it on my Xbox Series X. And it's just nice to know I won't have to worry about those those little loading screens. And even looking at some of the game footage that I've captured, it typically would take like quite a bit to load that up. And now it's just pretty seamless, which is also really nice. And I got to dabble a little bit in quick resume as well, which was kind of fun. Um, it's just, you know, if you're playing one game, you just I just push the little Xbox button and then I can go back to another game just instantly. I know we've seen this before, so it's not like I don't have to deep dive into what this is. But it is nice, especially for someone who, you know, like Andrea and Simer, you like to play games with other people sometimes. Yep, sometimes. <laughs> That's true. We do. It's yeah, true. You're in your little single player game and then you just push the little button and then blammo, you're back in your multiplayer blammo, game socializing blammo. with people. So yeah. Nice. For Miles yeah. Morales, okay, I wasn't as good as either of you. I did not take notes. <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do a timer, so I have no idea what the time, the loading times actually are. But I will definitely just say, like, even when starting at my PlayStation, getting it over to the application, clicking on that, like waiting for that to pop up and load, waiting for it to get to the loading screen where I can even like hit go. Then waiting for it to load my save and get into the world, like all of that. And then I did that on her console on the PS5 here. It was just like, <sighs> done. Like you're just in it. I was yeah. like, oh my God, this is incredible. This and is I actually stopped playing Miles Morales on PS4 because I was like, no, no, no. I you're feel waiting. like I want to play this on. I want to finish this game on PS5. And I'll talk more about that game later in the show. Nice. But. Yeah, it's that was exciting. Yeah, it's it's great. I think that's what a lot of people are really looking forward to is the performance time. Now, it's been challenging to really do an accurate deep dive in performance inside the game because as we mentioned, a lot of the games that we're playing don't have their final day one patches or day zero patches for when the consoles go live. So we'll have more impressions on that next week. And of course, you'll be able to play them for yourselves if you were able to snag a pre-order and you have yours being delivered next week. Um, but I also encourage you to seek out people who specialize in this. We talk about them all the time, but Digital Foundry is a great place to go if you want to really get the nitty gritty details in the way that frame rates are different, boot times, all of that. They have a lot of side-by-side -side comparison videos for both of the consoles. So they're probably going to be a better source for highly technical information when it comes to side-by-side -side performance. So I appreciate the share buttons on the console, on the controllers, but can we just have like an options button, like a literal settings options button that controls all of the main functions of the console? Like you know, I've never once, once yeah. hit the share button. I'm oh. like, I, like all those things. I'm like, no, this is not what I don't need this button to exist on my controller. I've hit it a lot by accident. Yeah. And I'm like, I, <laughs> wish it, I just wish it was another button. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, I wish it did any, anything else. Like, can I can you let me program it to do anything else? Because it's just a dead button for me. It's just chilling there. Like, I don't want to fucking share anything. Are you kidding me? Like, why? No, yeah, it would I'm be, not that person. I like 
in consoles of old, like that used to just be like the start button, right? Like the start menu. Yeah. Like, can we not just go back to the days where that button is just the <laughs> default? Like when I hit this, I'm going to go directly to the settings of the game I'm in or the settings of the console. Like, is that and now it's like, like is, the options? is it the touchpad? Is it triangle? Like, which one is it? And Back you, in our day, children, we had four buttons. buttons. There were we less buttons. Deep, we had a D-pad, we had a start, select, and we had four two. buttons and two or, on the top. Or two, like, or you want to go way, way back. Yeah, yeah, you want to go way back. Or if you <laughs> want to go way back to Atari, you had, like, a little waggle, jo- jo- little... <laughs> 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 yeah, Don't ever put it. that on the internet. I love oh, you I'm, guys. Totally, I'm totally going to get that. <laughs> God damn it, Brittany. Social media. Yeah, let's share that. Let's hit the share button on that little <laughs> that little nugget right there. There you go. Um, uh, I'm into it. I'm into it. <laughs> um, for now, that's going to probably be our thoughts on the consoles. Like I mentioned, we're going to have additional thoughts next week once we can kind of deep dive once a lot of these patches and all of the different functionality is live. There were specific sections of the Xbox Series X UI and specific sections of the PlayStation 5 UI that were not fully operational at the time of shooting the podcast, but they should be uh, by the time we shoot the podcast next week. So, because it's going to be, it's going to be launch week. Woo! <sighs> we're here! It's November, y'all! Oh my god. I, what is time? Yeah, what is time, man? And maybe by next week we'll know who the president's going to be. Now that's who like I was thinking that I was like, who yeah, November say? launch period. Like, I, I mean, I appreciate, I get it. November's the hot time to release your consoles, but why do you have to fucking do it? The embargo of the week of the election. Why? Please. Because... It's almost like they didn't know that there was going to be an election that week. I mean, who would have known? It's not like we've ever had an election before in November. You know. It's true. Yeah. Mm. Well, enough about that. Right now, we're going to take our first break of the show. When we come back, Brittany is finally going to spill the beans about Yakuza. And Steimer has a lot to say about Spider-Man. Hold on, I have a question. Uh, Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Spill the beans. Where did that come from? Like, where? when did someone have, like, a can of beans? Not what I thought you were going to say. No, you but know think what? about it. How about on the break, we'll look it up, and when we come back, we will tell you the story. Think about the it. Spill the beans comes from. Stick with us, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> she doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> You're like, we are no. outroing now. I definitely do. I definitely do. <laughs> I'm actually curious now. Um, I'll, I'll find out. I'll find out. Okay, you look it up while I do the announcement. <laughs> What's good, everybody? Time for just a few quick announcements. As you may have noticed, Lights Off is now over. So that means Monday streams are going to be sporadic going forward at twitch.tv slash what's good games. We highly encourage you to turn on that bell notification to let you get an email sent to you whenever we go live. We also have an announcement channel on the Discord at discord.gg slash what's good games that notifies you when we're live as well. But Thursdays are going to keep kicking for afternoons with Andrea. And I'm excited to announce that next Thursday, I'm going to be streaming on Twitch Gaming for the PS5 launch. And I'm going to be doing a whopper of a destiny 2 beyond light stream starting when the servers go live at 9 a.m on tuesday november 10th of course the series x launch day as well so please join us and hopefully you can uh have some fun streaming with us that's all i have to say about that enjoy all right i got important stuff about beans <laughs> okay, Brittany, tell me. Spill the beans, Brittany. I'll spill the beans on spill the beans. It is believed that this phrase originated in ancient Greece, where people cast secret votes by putting white or black beans in a jar, where a white bean indicated a positive vote and a black bean was a negative vote. So basically, we should be calling it black bean instead of black ball? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> Why not? Let's that girl got it. black bean. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, it's been a week. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Um, it has. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It is the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast, and this is where we talk about what we've been playing. And this week is brought to you by patreon.com slash what's good games, where you can support everything we do with a variety of membership tiers. 
I thought Britt was gonna say something, but she was just adjusting her microphone. Yeah. <laughs> you like getting a really cool postcard sent to you, or maybe you like watching our happy hour stream where we take your questions, or potentially you just don't want to hear ads on the show. So you are a epic member or above. Regardless of what your reason is, if you want to support What's Good Games, you can do so by pledging at patreon.com slash what's good games. The first game that we're going to talk about today is one that is highly anticipated for PlayStation fans. That's right. Spider-Man Miles Morales. So Steimer, yeah. you've sunk a decent amount of time in with the game. You I have. have dabbled. I've played like two hours. Yeah. Just dipped my toes in the water. And I played some of, of that. Split up. <laughs> Wait, what? I said, and I played some of that. It's that true. She did. I, I watched Steimer play some of it because I was just in a mood where my brain was just not firing on all cylinders because, you know, exhaustion. And um, I was like on the struggle bus in some of these fights. And I was like, I can't do this. And then both Steimer and John, who played far more of PS4 Spider-Man than I did, were like, you have to do the fight this way. Well, you know, you have to hit this button. I was like, stop backseat gaming me. <laughs> yeah. Just take the controller. I'm done. And I was like, hey, this is secretly my plan all along. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about your experience with Spider-Man Miles Morales. Yeah, so I was a really big fan of the original Spider-Man on PS4. Um, loved what they did with Peter Parker. Loved that story. Loved just swinging around Manhattan. I... I, don't, I didn't like 100% it, but I definitely completed a lot of the um, collectibles and the things that are place, placed around the world because I just had a really good time with it. Swinging felt really good. The whole game felt really good to me. So I was really looking forward to this game because Miles is a big part. Uh, well, not a big part, but he is a part of the original game and you get to kind of see him and get hints at when he becomes Spider-Man at the very end of that game. I guess spoilers, sorry. Um <laughs> Oops. He also becomes Spider-Man, in case you've never heard of this before. I don't and think I've been living a under a rock. It's not a spoiler. I mean, it's a it's a comic Miles book Morales, thing. Miles Morales. It's literally called Spider-Man Miles Morales. I know, Morales, I know, I know. So. Um, also, actually, I would like to interject here and say thank you, Sony, for providing me a code for this, um, because obviously there's no way I could have played this game really without your help. So, thanks. <laughs> um, so, Miles Morales is all dedicated, obviously, as it sounds, on Miles. This is a more of a like an expansion so think a little bit more along the lines of first light which got which is like a million years ago because infamous oh i yeah. really loved first oh, light infamous. though Gosh. uh but like just think of it as like a slightly beefed up expansion versus an entirely new game and you will be okay with your expectation setting um i think if you're going into it thinking it's going to be anything size wise in terms of like uh story as the first one you'll be disappointed um, right now I'm at 50%, um, my, whatever my completion rate is 50%. I will say I've done a lot of the collectibles, a lot of like the crates. Um, so that's mm -hmm. definitely contributed to it. But as I've gone through the story, um, I would say I'm, I'm, I feel like I kind of know where it's going. So like, I don't think this is going to necessarily have the same amount of twists and turns as the first game. Cause again, they, this one didn't have as much development time. So it's not really a knock on it. It's just something to be mindful of as you're going into the game so you have proper expectations. So that's Fair. interesting that you say that because based off what I saw in the skill tree, it didn't feel like it was just an expansion. It felt like it was a much bigger um, a much bigger world and a much longer progression system than like Horizon Frozen Wilds was, right? Sure. Yeah, I th they definitely make this game or whatever you want to call it, beef up game. DLC. This is like, <laughs> but in terms of like qualifying how much or how little or whatever, um, not a full retail game is kind of what I mean there. It really does feel different in the sense that Miles has its own style, which I really, really like. I would argue Miles is way more fun to play than Peter Parker. Ew. So in the original Spider-Man with Peter, you basically rely a lot more on gadgets. Peter has eight gadgets on the skill tree wheel because Peter doesn't like his spider powers are sorry, like a little bit more generic than miles. Miles has more interesting powers. Um, so now you have things like his bioelectricity, which again, if you've seen um, even, Oh my God, into the spider verse, I almost blanked in the name of that movie. <laughs> You'll know like a little bit more about his powers, uh, but he has bioelectricity 
And he also can go um, invisible, which is like fucking awesome. I don't know. I really, really love that. So I mean, yeah, going invisible is boss. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. it's great. Um, so what you've done, what they basically have done, again, PS4, uh, OG, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, a lot of those skill trees were really padded out with basic moves that you would need. So when you leveled up in that Spider-Man, you would get like six uh, skill points each time you leveled up and blah, blah, blah. And like you would have to unlock really basic shit, like being able to pull a gun out from somebody. Um, and so what they've kind of done is they've refined it a little bit here in Miles Morales. You only really get one skill point per level now, but those skill tree, the skill trees he has are much smaller and are much more, um, like impactful, impactful on your powers. So like there's a, basically a, what they call venom is his bioelectricity power. Um, they have that as one, and then they have a, a stealth or camouflage one. And then they have one that is kind of more beefing up your more basic stuff uh so it really does feel like they've edited a little bit here which i appreciate another element oh sorry what i'll say you stanmer loves a good editing i do love a good edit and i actually yeah the 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 part that they made much better is in again ps4 spider-man they i keep calling it ps4 spider-man but this one also is playable on ps4 so i'm confusing myself with that and peter parker (laughs) spider-man um (laughs) You had like so many different kinds of tokens, right? You'd like backpack tokens and crime tokens and like all these things. And each one, well, you needed to get a certain amount of each one in order to unlock a certain suit or unlock a power or do a thing. Um, here they've really streamlined it. So let me look at my note because I've already forgotten the names. So you only really have three things that you would need in this game. You have your skill points, which again are just tied to leveling up. There's nothing really you can do there. Then you have activity tokens, which are from everything or tech parts. So an activity token you would get from completing side missions, you would get from collect using one of the collectibles in the world, you could get from uh, completing, uh, not completing crimes, but <laughs> like taking down crimes, doing the crime quests rather. <laughs> doing crimes. Do not do crimes as Spider-Man, it will be bad. <laughs> the spider police will come to get you. Um, <laughs> but like those are, so it's, it's simplified. You don't have to worry too much about Oh, I need to do, I need to go chase down uh, like 15 more of these backpacks around the world. There are no backpacks here, but you know, you know what I mean? Like that kind of collectible in order to get this amount of tokens. It's just go do stuff. You will get the activity tokens. If you want tech points, you have another uh, type of thing you have to do for that. And that's it. So to me, that felt much, much better. It just feels like way cleaner. Um, And speaking of tech, so Miles does have some gadgets. He has four. Like I said, Peter had eight. Uh, but part of that is balanced because otherwise I think Miles would feel way too OP if he had eight gadgets and had his Venom powers and had <laughs> stealth. So he really has like web shooters. He has sort of a, a trip mine sort of situation. He has hollow bots, holograms, and he has a gravity well. So he's got a whole lot of different tools. Obviously, you don't unlock all of those at the same time. They happen as you progress throughout the story. Um, so you won't be like super OP Spider-Man to start with. But that was the thing. The one thing I've really liked seeing so far is Miles, just similar to Peter, very kind of uncertain, really wants to do good, really wants to be a good superhero and do good in the world, but feels like sometimes they just can't quite nail it. And I always just find that that is a really refreshing take on superheroes. It's better than like, whatever, I'm just the best. And like, huh. I don't <laughs> like know. A, the, the kind of cocky attitude that a superhero like Iron Man has, right? Yeah, exactly. I find, I like the endearing nature of Miles. I also like that Miles is very in tune with his family. Um, and you get to see a lot of that relationship with his mom. And obviously, uh, if you played the first game, you will know like his dad dies in that game. So you get to kind of see the new family dynamic. So what they basically, how they've changed it um, to make the map make sense, because he lived in Brooklyn before. Uh, He has now moved to Harlem. (laughs) They basically take over their abuela's old apartment. She apparently moves to Puerto Rico to retire. Good for her. She lived, she's living the life. Um, (laughs) And so they just take over this apartment in Harlem. That's why you are basically on the same map as you were in the last game. Um, They've also changed which I think is a really nice, fun change. So um, your friend Genki from the first game, he 
is a tech wizard. He's like, he makes a, a remark about like, he's building a game. He's doing all sorts of like computer stuff when you're, when he comes to stay at your house for a little bit. Uh, I guess I should have prefaced all of this by saying this takes place over winter break. It will be Christmas time in New York, which it's is so aw. fun. There's it's a moment so pretty in a, in like a exploration moment when you're in, in the, uh, the new apartment, the abuela's apartment where you can turn on the Christmas tree. Aww. And it's like, first off, like I, I'm with Steimer. Like, I just like, I'm so excited for Christmas to throw up everywhere. I'm like ready. I'm ready for it. Bring it on. I need this. I need this. I need it. Um, but like the moment where we saw the lighting effects inside the Christmas tree with the Christmas lights against the pine needles on the PlayStation five was just like a, it was like a, <laughs> yeah like, it was gorgeous like the i mean not to interrupt your your flow but like the game just also looks like it's jaw droppingly beautiful on ps5 no but. it looks beautiful and the it's really fun to see new york at christmas time as somebody who's never gotten to experience that in real life like you just you swing through the streets they have all the lights up um or like it, everything is basically covered in a light dust of snow which is really pretty uh. it just really makes you feel kind of cozy inside which is uh, really nice. And like, yeah, like Andrea said, like the game is just really gorgeous. So um, the I snow effects when we were swinging through New York, uh, when we were um, testing it out on the PS5, because Steimer wanted to see the differences between playing on PS4 and playing on PS5, like seeing the lighting and shadow effects on the snow on the ground from, P uh, from P not Peter, from Miles swinging yeah. so high up and being able to like see in very like clear detail because a lot of times when you're in an open world game and you're kind of traversing a lot of those graphics kind of get like blurred when you're in locomotion but these were just like crisp and you could see where the snow was and like the level of detail and how they're loading all those assets in using the hardware to accelerate that is just like that is such a good showpiece for what the next generation hardware can do oh uh, i'm just excited to walk around I, yeah. I'm with you. Like, I need that Christmas spirit right fucking now. You'll get it in this game, which is so nice. Because, yeah, like, Aww. I just want, I needed to preface that this whole game, at least so far, seems to take place over Miles' winter break. Um, and that's why, you know, your friend is over at your house and he builds you essentially an app that's integrated into your spider suit. So how you'll get side missions or you'll locate, uh, I keep saying, I keep wanting to say like how you'll locate crimes, like crimes happening that you will stop, not crimes that you will commit. Um, <laughs> those are, how do I find, how do I find a do? crime to do? I would like, no, that's what Britney's please. doing. Yakuza, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> yeah. It's the very opposite end of the spectrum, isn't it? Um, but it's so cute too. Like the app has the most adorable little art for Spider-Man on like it. It's chibi Spider-Man. It's chibi Spider-Man. It's so cute. Um, and it's just like a really nice, easy way for you to look at all of your quests or all the things that you can do uh, or just swipe it away. And then that way the map isn't usually too cluttered. The only things that really will appear on your map are collectibles. Um, there are some more hideout things that you can go clear, kind of similar to the first game. Um, and then there are like a couple, the main mission will obviously show up and then one of the major side missions will show up. But there's also like a bunch of other little side missions. They don't clutter on the map and it's just if you select it on your phone app then you will it will be like here it's over there and you can just track it and go um so, so yeah how do you feel about the map do you feel like it's a good size oh it's perfect i mean again like i really loved the first game because to me it was not overwhelming and i felt like it was completable even if i didn't feel like doing it i knew that it was not something that would be overwhelming to me and i feel the same way here like i almost have collected i think i only have like one or two more um of the really like the easy type of collectibles where it's sort of like the backpacks from last game it's not a backpack but i'm not gonna tell you what it is uh and then they're like the thing where you get tech points i almost have all of those too and um now and i've like cleared through a couple of the <clears throat> excuse me the enemy layers and those are i mean god i'm like doing perch takedowns left and right i'm like ha, how many perch takedowns can i do you are a spider web you are a spider web it's just like it reminded me so much of what i loved about the first game and then also when you get into that really brawly nature you have i have so much more fun with the venom powers just being able to lightning punch people is rad oh, it's really punch. really fun so what do you excited yeah what do you think about the price point knowing that this has been long 
compared and by some criticized for being an expansion of a standalone game at $49.99. Do you think that the amount of content that you've played and the quality of the content that you've played is sufficient for what Sony is asking gamers to shell out for it? It's hard to say. I can't remember how much First Light was. I feel like First Light was like a 39. Um, I would, I'll double check, but I think I think you're right there. Um, I feel like I, it's a little hard for me to say right now only because I want I do want to see the way the full campaign plays out. Because right now, I do feel like the main campaign feels a little bit... Um, I don't want to... I'm trying to think of like the best... Like predictable. Like I feel like I kind of know maybe where it's going to go. And maybe it'll take a twist that I do not see coming. I hope it does. But it also might just be kind of a, a predictable campaign. It might be a predictable-ish superhero story. Um, and I still think it's a really fun world to like go around and get lost in. If you like... If you're a suit collector, the suits work essentially the same as they did in the last game you'll unlock them and you'll get um they each have their own powers that you can then unlock and mix and match and use on depending on how you want to look uh so whether or not it's worth 49.99 i think there's definitely a decent amount of content there but i do feel like maybe it maybe could have been 39.99 like I don't really know. I'm not great at pricing things but <laughs> <laughs> but i think either way I've really been enjoying it. I think especially because of this year, it's just joyful, which is nice. It's nice to, again, like see New York in a Christmas time that feels like a normal Christmas time. There's people walking around the streets. There's trees being lit. Like you can have, you have oh. dinner with your family, right? Like there's just moments where you're like, oh, like little things that you just take for granted. And maybe this would not be very impactful if it was any other year. And I think that that's something that's hard to separate um, when you're really talking about something like this, because we have been basically in lockdown for so long that now looking at something like that, it just brings you a joy that you didn't necessarily, that it, it might not at any other time, or it might not have the same level of it. So if people are planning on getting a PS5, mm -hmm. but they might not be able to get it right away, should they wait to play this game or has your experience on PS4 been also good? It's fine on PlayStation 4. However, the thing that made me absolutely go, I don't want to play this anymore on PS4 was when I played, started playing on PS5 and it was quiet because my <laughs> PlayStation, oh my God, it's working so hard. <laughs> it's working so hard to make this game work. <laughs> It just sounds like it's dying, like at, dur especially during the cutscenes. It's so loud that I have to turn up the volume on my TV to hear the game oh my God. because the thing is just like, <laughs> like about to take off into space. And I just like, I, can't, I don't want to do it anymore. It's weird. I actually like didn't accidentally, but I paused once in the middle of a cutscene because I wanted to like, go um, like wash my face or something. And just like listening to it, worry. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I paused you in the middle of a cutscene. What was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just so if you if you were already planning on getting a PS5, even oh. if it needs to be a little bit later, I would say wait on it, um, especially because I do think it might be more fun to play this game when it's a little closer to Christmas time. Yeah. You could really kind of, I don't know, bunker down with some cocoa and, oh. and swing around and be like, oh, it's snow in New York and it's going to be that like a perfect holiday so break nice. game. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And and like I said, there's enough stuff to do, but there's not, it's not going to be, so please don't expect it to be like, um, like a watchdog size or like even a, the oh amount of God. anything in a Ubisoft game where there's just <laughs> stuff know. everywhere. No, it's oh, not that. I don't want it's, that. It's not so, going to be that. <laughs> I tried to desperately nicely. finish Odyssey before Valhalla. And I was like, why Ubisoft? Why? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not that it's completable. It will absolutely, um, I really like Miles. He puts a smile on my face. Seeing the way he interacts with the world puts a smile on my face. It's always nice to see um, representation in games. It's fun hearing him speak Spanish with his mom. There's so much Spanish in the game, which I think is such an amazing touch, knowing his Puerto Rican background. How Insomniac really incorporated that into this game, I think is important, particularly this year when we talked about how representation is so important to so many people out there and they just don't get that representation very often and getting somebody like Miles Morales and how Insomniac's like, you know what, we're really just going to 
tell his story and try to be as authentic as possible. I thought was really great. And I, I thought it was a nice touch as well when I turned on captions that they translated all the Spanish. But if you turn the captions off, like they're just talking in Spanish. So yep. you either know what they're saying or you don't. Yep. Hmm. It was just a nice little a nice little touch that his mom is always talking to him in Spanish. Yeah, it's cute. All right, four years in high school. See if you're still in the old noggin. <laughs> <laughs> you got this, Brittany. I believe in you. Oh, this is really good, though. I'm really excited, and it makes me so happy to hear how much you love it, Simer, because, uh, yeah, it just sounds like a really good feel-good game. And I know there's a lot of questions of, like, is this going to be a, next, a whole, like, new game, or is it just going to be a little expansion? Is it going to be a rip-off? And it sounds like... Regardless it's kind of like somewhere of in between. Yeah. <laughs> like it's more than there you go. just it's more than like your regular DLC, but it's definitely less than what or you know original Spider-Man was, but Miles again feels so great in combat. Yeah. Um, I really hope that they give him another like an actual full-fledged game uh where they really really can get a, an amazing narrative arc like Peter got. Um because I think that that storytelling was just so much fun to me. It was so great to see Peter with Mary Jane. It was f- so fun to see him with Aunt May. It was so fun to see him like tackling his problems as Spider-Man and tackling his problems as Peter. And you kind of get that a little bit here, but it's it's just condensed. <laughs> right? Like it's just so it has to be because of what the timelines that they had. And I know that there's people out there that are very upset that Miles Morales didn't get a full tentpole release like Peter Parker did. And you get to feel your feelings, but I think it actually was really smart for them to shorten the scope of this game so that it can be the showpiece for the launch of the PlayStation 5 because now Sony has this amazing, exclusive, gorgeous title that they can launch in holiday with with a household name like Spider-Man that I think is going to absolutely help sell consoles. And like I was mentioning during our talk about the consoles with the 3D audio and the haptic feedback and the rumble in the controller, like you're going to get all of those really snazzy features when you play Spider-Man Miles Morales on PS5 that you're not going to get when you play it on PS4. And you're certainly not going to get a Spider-Man type experience that's exclusive to Xbox, right? And I think that that's something we've been talking about for a long time. The Series X just does not have that thing. And while I get that there's kind of like a lamenting moment of like, you know, oh, we could have had so much more. I think, like you said, Steimer, this lays the groundwork for now Insomniac to take some time and say, hey, we're going to hunker down and make maybe they make something else. But maybe they, you know, go dark for a while and say we're going to make a really big next Spider-Man thing. And then Miles is going to play a bigger part in that. And so, yeah, like Miles just basically gets an even like another arc. And and that's a much more uh, Spider-Man PS4 style way like because i can't imagine like them building out a combat system that is as fun as it is with miles and then just being like and that was it (laughs) peace out bye guys like (laughs) because it really is just so satisfying and now i feel like i couldn't possibly go back and play i mean this maybe is a little snotty but like couldn't possibly go back and play as peter like (laughs) with just his gadgets but um it's it's funny and also like a, a really cute thing um so you have like training grounds there as well, which will unlock specific skills. And those are run by like hologram Peter. And it's just pretty funny to see a lot of those quips. So like you still do get a little bit of Peter in this game, which is nice. Best of both worlds. Yeah. Aww, I think they did a yay. really nice job with it. Sounds like it's nice and edited like you like it. <laughs> yes. Good job, Insomniac. You did it. You did the thing. All right, Brittany. The time oh. has come. From the oh. spider to the dragon. Let's go. Let me get up my all my fucking notes. Oh, here we go. I'm so excited. This is a good day. <laughs> this is a great day. Okay, so I am going to be talking about Yakuza Like a Dragon. So this is developed by Ryuga Kutoku. I always say that wrong, but I think I nailed it this time. Published by Sega and actually released in Japan earlier this year, in November of 2020. And we're just now getting the game over here in the West. And, you know, localization is hard and it takes time. So there you go. We're finally getting it. So obviously, thank you, Sega, for the review code. Thank you, Xbox, for the review code. And I'm about 30 hours in at this point, and I would say maybe like halfway through the story or so. Um, I've been doing a lot of side stuff. And traditionally, Yakuza games are very long, beefy games. So like this isn't if your panties are like, oh, my God, 30 hours. It's like that's very short for you. Yakuza game. I do anticipate I'll put another like 20 to 30 in. Um, 
I will be keeping this spoiler free because I think there's a lot of charm in gems to be found in this game that are best discovered by yourself. So if you're new to Yakuza, this is essentially think of it as like the eighth major installment in the franchise. You have Yakuza 0 through 6, which follows the same cast of characters, more or less, and the same setting. And then this is like a, a brand new a start to Yakuza and you do not have to have played any of the other games to get what's happening. But if you do, if you have played them, there'll be some fun Easter eggs and some returning characters that will, uh, you'll get a kick out of them. So Yakuza like a dragon, the plot follows Kasuga Ichiban. And if you've played the other games, it takes place around the beginning of Yakuza one. And around that time, Ichiban takes the fall for the, a Tojo clan member for a crime that he didn't commit. They're like, yo, you're a grunt. Take the fall for this crime. He's like, okay, cool. I just want to please you and make you happy. And he does. And so he's in prison for almost 20 years. And when he comes out of prison, we're now in 2019, which if you follow the Yakuza timeline, you are now after Yakuza 6, which is the last main Yakuza game. So that's kind of like a fun little tidbit. And of course, like a lot of shit has gone down in those almost 20 years that he was in prison. So as you can imagine, no one is... Things aren't quite the same as they were when he before he went in. And so the plot more or less follows Ichiban trying to reconnect with the Tojo clan, which is who he's associated with before, and um, kind of starting a new life, but of course getting involved in some shady dealings, because of course it's a Yuki. He does game. the crimes. He does the crimes. Actually, Ichiban is a very good character he, in the sense that he he kind of he kind of reminds me of Miles Morales when you're talking about him. He wants to do good and he wants to do the right thing. He's just a little naive, and he's a cross between Kiru and Majima. For those of you who played Yakuza, you get what I'm saying. And he's really fun in that sense. He's a, he's a good guy, just a little just a little dumb sometimes. But you gotta love him. And so this game eventually does take you out of. Well, I won't spoil that. You have a new setting this time, Yokohama. And if you're used to Kamurocho, which is the primary setting for the first games, Yokohama is about four times the size of that map. That said, it doesn't feel overly overwhelming or anything. Um, it's a very interesting map in the sense that you have all these different districts. You have the red light district, you have the bar district, you have Koreatown, you have Chinatown, you have Restaurant Row. So there's a lot of different areas to explore, and each district more or less has its own little like culture feel to it. So it's really fun. It's not as like lively and vibrant as Kamurocho, which is essentially one big red light district, but there is some of that in Yokohama. And where other games <laughs> follow, like the where the other Yakuza games have followed the nitty gritty, like under criminal underworld of the Yakuza, one of the changes that uh this one has is it more or less follows like a civilian lifestyle at first and you're kind of like oh this is really this is really interesting because it, it, it's not something you would expect from yakuza like a man trying to start his life anew it's like oh well where, where are all my total clans where's the omni alliance where are all these like gangsters and whatnot and um yeah it's a little different in that sense so i just want to set, set, set some expectations and there are a lot of cutscenes in this game and a lot of narrative i think about what was that metal gear solid game ladies that was all like cutscenes. Was it five? Five had a bunch of cutscenes, but when I think about a game that has a ton of cutscenes, I immediately think Death Stranding. <laughs> like, oh, I think it go. was four though that had the like. Oh, maybe you know, it was MGS. four. Yeah, I think it was four. That was the infamous like hour long cutscene or something crazy. Oh, know? maybe that was it. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of times where things like during cutscenes. There you go. Hooray! And you're like, all right, I'm gonna make myself an ego waffle, and I'm gonna sit, <laughs> and I'm. <laughs> An ego waffle. Gonna, I love it. I'm gonna enjoy enjoy this this movie playing out in front of me. And so I feel like in that sense, it's a lot more cinematic than other Yakuza games as well, which just like isn't a bad thing. They're all really well done and animated. Uh, but the biggest change to the Yakuza the Yakuza Like a Dragon is obviously this game has been given like a JRPG makeover, which I, I believe RGG Studios teased it as an April Fool's joke, but then it was like actually no, like this is actually what this game is. It is almost like a JRPG, and the reason for that is Ichiban is obsessed with Dragon Quest, you know, the the JRPG. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, he sees everything through the lens of being a hero. He sees everything through the lens of being a JRPG. So now, like, <laughs> with that in mind, like, you would think, what? Because Yakuza is typically an action brawler, but it actually works. 
So you notice this, one of the biggest changes with this that comes along with it is you now have a party of characters that you travel around with. And you can have up to three in your party at once. And as you walk around Yokohama, you know, there will be little banters that your characters have back and forth with one another. I think there's over like 150 of them that you can unlock, which is really wow, fun. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. It's all about being at the right place at the right time, right? Sometimes they'll walk by like a laundromat or a swing set in a park. And then one of the characters will be like, oh, I have something to say about this. And they have some really fun acted banter between the two of between the three of them. And then you get into the combat, which is like so silly, but I love it so much. So you have you you run across the enemies in the street and you're like, all right, like there you are, there I am. And typically in the other games, you would just start punching bitches. But in this one, it's it's like raw battle commence. And then you have your actions. You have your attack option, your skill option, your guard option, and then your et cetera, where you can use healing items or buff items, or eventually you'll unlock something called the pound mates, which are essentially summons. And I love like just like the things that you'll summon. You'll summon um oh Nancy, the crawfish, for example. Okay. That's one of the summons, which is fucking fantastic. She comes from the sky. There is a chicken you can summon. She comes from a, the sky? Shouldn't she come from the water? Well, it's like a, a Final Fantasy summon. Oh, okay. So it's like Got it. lightning breaks and then like start the, the sky goes black and, and the then down comes sings. the crawfish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The crawfish. Well, no, the crawfish doesn't sing. Ah, oh, summons. Okay. Yeah. One of the it's so, mechanics in games ever. It's She's so like, come crazy. here. Fight for me. <laughs> Oh, my God. So, yeah, you unlock this thing called Pound Mates. And essentially, yeah, that's your summon mechanic. Um, it's funny. To unlock Pound Mates, you have to do a quest called A Trip to Pound Town. Which of is like course. Exactly amazing. How <laughs> very Yakuza. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so good. Um, and then it's fun, too, because in, like, JRPGs, you have all these classes you can choose from. And what's fun about them is your characters outside the battle, they'll be wearing their classical attire. Like, you can't really change that. But depending on what class you're in, when battle commences, your characters will change into a tire that fits that class. So, for example, uh, right now, Ichiban in my game is a host. And so, you know, host from like a host club in Japan. And so he's wearing like this really snazzy suit and his bottle, his uh, weapon is a bottle of champagne. And so he yes, like sprays I'm enemies with it. it. You, yeah, like hits people with it. You can be a chef class and you wear like a silly chef hat and then you smack people with like spatulas and whatnot. Um, the female characters have some fun classes too, like an idol, like a pop star. You can be a hostess from a hostess club, or you can be a night queen, which essentially means you're just wearing all leather and you're like a dominatrix Ooh. and you smack people with whips and that you can like step fun. on them. Yeah, no, it's so silly, but it's so good. It, it, that's what's so interesting about it is, and I think that's why it works is it's because it retains that Yakuza charm and that silliness, but in a turn-based mode. And I've had a lot of questions from people asking like, well, I don't like turn base. Well, I like this. I'm like, I think you will. Cause it's, it feels so much like Yakuza still, but obviously like now it's kind of a JRPG in some sense, but again, it goes together. Yeah. Watching uh, the battles um, in the, and what we are, yeah. some of the trailers that we've, we've been watching now. It's just, I'm like Look looking at, at it and like, you, you can't help but <laughs> smile because it's just yeah. so ridiculous, but in such a lovely way. It is. Yeah. Like, it's just so fun. And it does make you smile. And it does make you laugh. Like, he just smashes a cake into somebody's face. How yeah. how amazing is that, that that's how you take somebody down? And this is one of the, uh, yeah, this is one of the classes right now. And she can tell she's doing one of her special moves. No, it's so great. And that's kind of been the thing about the Yakuza. It's always this. The longstanding joke is Yakuza is a gritty crime drama. But then it shows you'll see silly photos and whatnot of like this kind of stuff and you're like how do these two things go together but they go together so well and it's it, all they just did such a great job <laughs> and the uh, look at this is the chef i know yeah the chef yeah. Words. i mean honestly the yeah of the pepper <laughs> the pepper is, my is part. really good <laughs> the oh, pepper, and there's you know. so many classes you can choose from I, I would say like at least 10 for the male characters i know you have about five or six for the female maybe five for the female characters and you can change. Look how good! Look how good this is. You can change between them at will. Um, you just have to go to a certain um location within the game, and then you can be like, "Yo, I want to change my class." And then with classes, you get a whole new set of obviously skills because it wouldn't make much sense, you know, if like the host was sprinkling pepper on people. That's like right. the chef's thing. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's really great about the Yakuza series that's back is just the wide variety of side stuff to do. And like I mentioned earlier, like I've just been doing so much side stuff, probably like. 
I would say a third of my playtime has just been doing the side activities. And so you have a fun business management sim, which I realized probably doesn't sound that much fun on paper, but think of it as like, <laughs> probably think, think of it as like there was a, a hostess, a cabaret a management sim and some of the other games as well. And it's just a really fun way to make money. And then as you progress, you unlock some certain skills, like you can smack people with big wads of cash and it's actually a really powerful move. There is racing, there's a mini quest system called part-time hero, which is essentially like a whole bunch of little mini quests you can do that will net you money and new opportunities to do other things. And then like one of the silliest things is the Sujimon, which is supposed to be a playoff of Pokemon. And you find this random dude in a dojo and he's wearing like a white lab coat, like Professor Oak. And he's like, hello, like, I want you to help me fill out my Suji decks, like the Pokedex. And essentially what you do is you go around and you defeat different uh, criminals. And depending on the criminal you defeat, the bad guy you defeat, it fills in your Suji decks with that criminal. Um, so, for example, you know, you're, when Ichiban, when you, when you commence battle, the, the, the folks that you fight, they're normal like thugs walk in the street. They turn into kind of monster-esque type of opponents because that's how Ichiban sees them. <laughs> And sometimes they'll, they'll be rare, rare spawns. So maybe um, a thug will turn into a person wearing or using a, a trash can lid and like a bat. And now like that's his sword and shield. Right. And then that's maybe called like the warrior Sujimon, for example. I'm just like kind of kind of giving some examples here. And then if you defeat them, it goes into your Suji decks and then you get rewards as you keep going. So it's like some silly stuff. And like when you start out the I don't want to spoil it. Actually, I want everyone else to figure it out themselves. Anywho, I'm gushing. Because I just like love this game so much. I will say though, it did take a while to like truly hook me. And I think that's because I played all seven games back to back to back earlier this year. And because I fell in love with the characters and the settings. And so then to kind of take a game that felt very Yakuza like, but not with the characters that I'd come to know and love, it was kind of hard to like fall in love with them. I'm sorry, but I, I wasn't did. laughing at you. I was laughing at the chicken shooting a ping pong ball out of his butt. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that's it. That's the egg. And sometimes it'll heal you or it'll get restore your magic power. <laughs> that's a summon. <laughs> so oh, <boy>. excellent. <laughs> um, yeah. So again, like it's, it's just really fun. And, and I would say if you're a diehard Yakuza fan, like just keep an open mind because it can be kind of jarring at first to be playing this game, but not have your Majima and your Kiru around. And there's the crawfish Nancy, um, you know, and getting that typical relationship that you're accustomed with them. And, but I will say like, just keep an open mind and they will grow on you and you will learn to love it. Uh, and something else I really do love about this game is it's very open-minded in the sense that you have a lot of interaction with the homeless community in the game. And Ichiban, for example, was raised in a soap land, which is essentially a brothel. And so he's very compassionate towards sex workers. And so you come across a lot of characters in this game who are trying to, um, you know, be rude or, or, or be discriminate against the homeless or discriminate against sex workers. And the game takes a stance and it's like, no, fuck you. Turns out you're the asshole. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. And so in that sense, like I'm still kind of early on with the story, but I, I really do appreciate that they're doing that. Cause like, it's like, yeah, like how often do you see games where they, it almost feels like they almost go out of their way, but not in a bad way to humanize and to make you feel like, oh yeah, people who don't, have an open mind with this stuff are the real assholes here and so it's it's just nice in that sense but anywho i'm gushing i'm done gushing now any questions for the panel from the panel yeah you can gush as much as you want brett we know how much you love yakuza and you've been waiting for this game all year for it to arrive i think what would be interesting and you've obviously answered this question on social media but because we will inevitably have somebody in the comments ask it again if nobody, not nobody, that's not what I meant to say. If somebody <laughs> wanted to jump into the Yakuza franchise with Like a Dragon, do you think that they're going to be lost? Or do you think that the game is going to be accessible to people without them having played anything from the franchise before? Yeah, yeah. You can definitely hop into it without knowing anything. Um, like I said earlier, like, if you have played the other games, there's going to be some fun Easter eggs and characters that are going to reappear that you'd be like, ah, oh, I know what that's from, and you'll get a good chuckle out of it. But otherwise, like, you won't know any different, and it won't, you know, it won't prevent you from enjoying the game as much as someone who has seen those things. So you can definitely hop in. I still would recommend playing Yakuza 0 first because, like, you know. But you know, that's just me being biased. But yeah, I mean, if, if Yakuza Like a Dragon has your interest, and I've seen a lot of folks saying like, hey, I really like Persona. 
would I, would I like Yakuza like a dragon? And I think that's an interesting question. And I would say like, yeah, I think you would just know that, you know, while I think Persona is very like anime in the, in the way that it presents itself and whatnot, Yakuza is more realistic and it is much more mature, but obviously as you've seen, and I've talked about, it's silly as hell. So there's a little balance there. I think Persona is realistic in a lot of ways. I mean, obviously it has bizarro monsters, but a lot of the other real world stories are very grounded. So I actually think that they probably do have a similarity there. Like there's an element of groundedness to it, but also an element of just wacky fan fantasy. No, that's a good point. Let me clarify. I mean, more realistic in the sense that it takes place in a huge city and it looks much more. And not a high school? Not a high school. Right. And there's. You're saying high school's whole... not real. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, high school's not real. But no, like Simon points, wish. like Simon said, and I said, like, I think there is a lot of crossover here and I think you could enjoy it a lot. Um, I still haven't finished it. I'm really excited to see where the story goes. I spent about six hours yesterday just doing the business management system because of all the election coverage, and I was really stressed, and it was great. Um, it, and it is just one of those feel-good games that you can really get lost in, and I think it's super immersive, and the characters really do grow on you, and you really uh, feel connected to them, and you are rooting for them. And in that sense, like, you just never know where this game's going to go. Like, one minute, it's all super serious. And the next, like I said, you're saving a crawfish named Nancy so you can summon her later in battle. Yeah, it's just it's just bonkers. And I think it's it's a really, it is a feel-good game. Not so much in the, like, Steinberg was talking about with Miles Morales, but in a different sense. Just Do like, um, you have any specific thoughts on how it ran on the Series X in particular? Or did you not really notice much of a difference knowing that this is more of a port? So, yeah, I haven't played on any other system, just to clarify. It's only been on the Series X, and it looks great. I mean, it's definitely the best-looking Yakuza game we've seen. It's not – it doesn't have, like, that photorealism that, let's say, Watch Dogs Legion has because that's just not the art style they're going for. Yeah. So, and more or less, I haven't had any issues. I did have a few – I have had this weird bug, and I'm assuming this will be patched before it goes live. I mean, I'm hoping. But it's if I'm playing a game and my controller, if I'm playing Yakuza and my game um, disconnects because I step away for too long and the controller turns off as it does and you go back to boot it up about seven out of 10 times, the audio won't work anymore in the game, <laughs> which is like kind of a weird thing. So I have to force quit the game and then boot it back up. And even then, sometimes it won't work. Sometimes I have to restart the Xbox. And that only happens, like I said, if I step away for too long. Um I also had a weird issue where my save data, even though it was in the system, wasn't registering on the title screen. And I panicked because at that point I was like 25 hours in. Yeah, that's a reasonable panic. Yeah. That was a panic. But I think that could have been because Xbox was pushing some quick resume updates. Mm. Because, yeah, that could have yeah. been what that was. In that weird pre-launch phase. Yeah. That weird pre-launch phase. Hard to phase. tell what's real and what's not. <laughs> It's but true. it came back after a good old restart. Like good, cat. good, good. Um, I do have a couple questions here from our patrons at patreon.com slash Games. One Mitch Crescent asks, how is Like a Dragon's new side and supporting characters in the party? Mostly it seems like there have been promos around the main character, but of the, are the rest of the party just as fun? By the oh. way, I just started Yakuza 0 last week and having a blast yay become one of us um yeah so obviously obviously Ichiban is like the star of the show he's definitely the one I think with the biggest personality and that's obviously intentional but the other characters once you get to know them um yeah they're, they're very entertaining and very fun and they're each all very different and there is a lot of I said that in-game banter that's written so you really do get a fun piece of uh, or some good insight into like who they are outside of their cutscenes. And the cutscenes are, like, really great, too, like I said. And you really do get to be like, okay, this is this character. I know what I can expect from them. This is this character. I know what I can expect from them. And they all have their own little side stories. And I didn't talk about this, but there is a – it's like a bonding system um, in the sense that after you spend enough time with those characters in battle or maybe you take them out to eat somewhere – their affection will grow towards you and then it'll cap. And the only way to break past that cap is to go to your hideout at a bar and have like a, a fun little cutscene with them. And then you'll learn about like their backstories and what's currently troubling them. And that's a fun way. It's, it's a fun character development uh, mechanic. And it's not like we haven't seen that before in a game, but again, in the Yakuza game, like that's pretty new. Um, I will say overall, that I think there were some growing pains associated with taking a Yakuza game and kind of, like I said, given a JRPG makeover. 
I don't blame RGG Studios for wanting to try something new. Like all they've really done is Yakuza and it's all been more or less the same. But, you know, for example, there's some dungeon crawling in this game. And essentially what that is, is you're in these under, and I've only come across two of these, but it, it was enough. There's these <laughs> underground, <laughs> these underground tunnels and you go from like, it's like four levels and it takes far too long and it's so repetitive. They're all like, it looks like a sewer on the inside and it's all very linear. I mean, there are some like paths that go off, but there's usually just like an item waiting for you at the end. Anyway, so you like go down a path. There's a group of enemies that you can't avoid. You fight them. Go down another path, group of enemies. You can't fight them. And it lasted far too long and I never want to do it again. And like, I appreciate what they were trying to do with that, but it's like, this, this should have just been cut. You didn't have to do that. It's okay but if so it's not far. a perfect game, you know. Oh happens. no! I mean, it's absolutely not a perfect game, but it's just uh, for for taking for doing what they did. I think it's really impressive that that's like really my only main complaint right now. So, okay, wow. the last question from patrons is from Devin, and Devin asks, "What is giving you the most joy while playing Yakuza Like a Dragon?" Oh man, the most joy. I think it just really comes down to the dynamic between the characters and watching them interact and seeing what crazy ass situations they get themselves into. And like I said earlier, you just never know where this game's going to go. Like I said, one minute it's super serious and the next minute something totally bonkers off the wall is happening. And I think it's that that air of mystery that I think I get a lot of joy in. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just a fun little game to play right now, especially with all the shit that's going on. It's just like, oh, like... This is a fun world. This is a better world right now than the one we live in. And it's silly and it doesn't take itself too seriously. Well, that's yeah. great. I think anything that is bringing you joy, uh, no matter how weird and wacky it is, how many crawfish are, <laughs> are involved <laughs> on screen at a time, um, is a good thing. And I think we're going to be spoiled as gamers with an embarrassment of riches of choice this fall I mean we have been this year there's been a phenomenal amount of games that have been just a joy to play but I'm glad that you finally get your Yakuza fix Ooh. and that um, you're gonna keep playing and I'm sure we'll hear more about it in future shows oh you will I'm sorry I mean sorry not sorry but you don't will. be sorry we're, we're prepared for this it's like <laughs> how you two are prepared that next week I'm gonna have to talk about destiny it's gonna oh, have it's to happen. Been so long <laughs> Listen, it's been a while since I've taken a deep it dive. Has. It's, okay, it, no, true. it has. I wasn't being sarcastic. It has been. It's going to be like the good old times. <laughs> We're really going to be like, what year is it? <laughs> is it 2014? Are we at the right launch? No, that was <laughs> that was Vanilla Destiny. Um. All right. Well, Britt, thank you for that report on Yakuza. Thank you to everybody who wrote in questions. We are excited to uh, talk more about the next-gen consoles, and we hope that you guys enjoyed the show. On Monday, we are going to be joined by a special guest. Kayla Jouet from Uppercut is going to be on What's Good Games Live with us, and then Alana Pierce is returning to What's Good Games for the Friday show. We're very excited to have both of them. It's going to be great. Until then, enjoy your weekend. Hopefully, you can get some rest and recover from all the candy you ate last weekend and prepare. Console launch is imminent. All right, that's it for us. Bye, everybody.